and you're listening to the History of Philosophy podcast, brought to you with the support of the Philosophy Department at King's College London and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode will be an interview about religious tolerance in the Reformation and early modern Europe with Maria Rosa Antoniazza. Hi, Maria Rosa. Hi. Thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Yeah, my pleasure. You've published on this topic before, and in a recent article you wrote about it, you said, and this is a quote from you, whether there is or there is not such a thing as religious truth is in itself neutral as regards toleration. So can you explain why? Yes, you will have uh, already been uh, discussing uh, the problem uh, of religious wars uh, and uh, all uh, the disruption, uh, which uh, this uh, terrible violence uh, as brought to Europe and in particular early modern Europe. So one uh, typical way to address uh, this sort of problem uh, is to think, well, uh, if religious wars uh, were the result uh, of uh, a fight uh, over the fine points of theology, wouldn't it be the best thing uh, just uh, to try to eliminate that by saying that there is uh, no such a thing as uh, objective religious truth? And uh, this is, in fact, what historically has been done uh, by certain uh, prominent uh, thinkers. Uh, For instance, Spinoza, one distinctive thesis of Spinoza is to say that religion, uh, theology, does not have to do with truth at all. It has to do with other things, uh, with piety, with obedience, not with truth. Uh, Truth uh, has to do with uh, philosophy. So the question uh, I have been asking in this uh, article is, uh, is really the case that uh, a fruitful uh, path to religious toleration uh, will be to think that there is uh, no such a thing as a religious truth, an objective religious truth? And my thesis is that this uh, question is actually neutral uh, to the question of religious toleration, uh, because uh, when we are dealing with toleration, uh, The question is not whether a doctrine or some proposition is true or is false. The question is what one believes to be true can be tolerated. So the question is not whether a group of believers are or are not believing something true. The question is whatever they believe to be true is that to be tolerated. So I might, for example, think that your beliefs about God are false or your beliefs about, let's say, the Eucharist are false. But as long as I think that it's okay that you believe something false in some sense of okay, Mm -hmm. then I'll tolerate you. Yeah. So it's not whether I think there is a fact of the matter about the Eucharist. It's more maybe like at a second order or like a meta level. It's really what I believe about the status of your religious beliefs and how important it is or the way in which it's important that they're true. That's what makes the difference. Yes, I think so. Because uh, in fact, uh, if uh, you are uh, a religious believer, and uh, for instance, if you believe that it is uh, integral uh, to your religious beliefs to pray five times a day, turning toward Mecca, say, it would not be tolerant of your beliefs uh, to say, no, look, that is really not something which is uh, true in order to have uh, a proper worship of God. And in fact, uh, I think that historically, this move has been done in uh, saying, well, we can uh, ground uh, religious toleration uh, in uh, a minimal set of beliefs. In the most extreme versions of this, it has, uh, as in the case of Spinoza, has been said, uh, we can uh, just say that uh, religion does not have to do with truth at all. But I don't think that that is in itself uh, tolerant uh, of the beliefs uh, of people who are uh, actually religious believers. uh, Because uh, from their point of view, that is true. And if you are telling them, no, that has nothing to do with truth, you are not tolerating their beliefs. It's almost like you're not taking their religion seriously. Exactly, exactly. Would it make a difference if we said that although a lot of religious beliefs, like let's say the Trinity or 
what happens with the host and the Eucharist. So some of these things that we've seen being matters of controversy during the Protestant Reformation, would it make a difference if we said, sure, those things are kind of like mysterious and it's not very clear what we should think about them. They're very difficult, deep theological issues, but there will be a core of things that everyone should agree with. For example, the existence of God. And the reason everyone should agree with those things is that just the natural use of reason should establish them. And so then you might think someone could say, I'm tolerant because I only require that people agree to whatever natural reason should establish. But although I require them to believe that, I don't require them to have any particular views on, let's say, the Trinity or the Incarnation. My view is that that is not in itself a particularly tolerant position, because uh, as I said before, uh, toleration is not about uh, finding uh, agreement uh, on certain fundamental truths. There might be substantial disagreement on that. Toleration is about uh, respecting uh, differences uh, in what one believes to be true, also on uh, fundamental matters like is God one or is God three, um, polytheism versus monotheism. So as regards specifically religious toleration, uh, I think uh, it would not do to tell uh, a polytheist, uh, say, well, uh, you can be tolerated in your beliefs uh, as long as you recognize that by natural reason, uh, there is only one God. Mm-hmm. I don't think that that would be a particularly tolerant position uh, or to tell uh, people uh, who are uh, completely committed uh, to the Eucharist, uh, well, you can be tolerated uh, as long uh, as you recognize uh, that uh, it doesn't matter whether uh, there is uh, really or not the body of Christ. Because uh, to them, uh, it matters uh, to tell them uh, you can be tolerated uh, as long as you think it doesn't matter, is in fact not tolerating their beliefs. Right. Okay. And I guess that there's a difference between tolerating in the sense of actually using, let's say, violence Mm -hmm. to compel belief, as opposed to tolerating in the sense of actually like taking their view seriously or something. So are we talking here about tolerance in terms of something like respect of other people's beliefs, or are we just talking about whether political compulsion is being brought to bear? I think I am talking about both, because as a minimum, I think there shouldn't be political uh, compulsion uh, to believe uh, certain things uh, if these things uh, are not against the law and uh, are not harmful uh, to other people. I do think, and uh, early modern people uh, I have studied, I do think that there are certain limits to toleration, and uh, these limits uh, are the limits of what is against the law and what is harmful uh, to other people. So as Leibniz says, uh, for instance, opinions uh, should be tolerated uh, as long as it does not include uh, something like uh, bringing uh, violence uh, to the state on a principle of religion. Obviously, we see this also nowadays. Uh, one can tolerate uh, all sorts of religious beliefs as long as that does not result uh, in uh, terrorist uh, attacks uh, or violence uh, to other people. So I am definitely talking uh, about tolerating uh, beliefs uh, in a way which uh, does uh, not result uh, in a coercion uh, toward the people uh, who do not align uh, with what, say, is the mainstream religion of a certain country. But I am also talking about a higher level of toleration, which is respect for other people who have different beliefs, with which you might genuinely disagree. You might genuinely think that they are false, but still, I think toleration requires that you respect people who, in good faith, have a a different view. Yeah, and of course, even debating someone in good faith is a way of respecting. Yes, uh, as again, uh, early modern uh, authors I have studied, uh, what they said is uh, the way to combat, as you like, uh, a doctrine that you think is false uh, is not a coercion, but a persuasion. Right. You can engage in debate, you can engage in dialogue, you can reason with this uh, people with whom you genuinely disagree, but it should not be in terms of uh, your beliefs, cannot be tolerated uh, in this country, and therefore either 
you accept uh, that what you are believing uh, is not uh, true, is not important, uh, is uh, indifferent uh, to worship of God, uh, or uh, it cannot be accepted. Historically speaking, it was the concept of a natural law here source for intolerance in this period, because sort of looking back over the last few things you've said, you said, well, you have to abide by the law. And I guess you meant there the law of a state. But if like, say, Aquinas, you believe that there's a natural law that would include things like the responsibility to believe in one God, then you might say, well, anyone who doesn't believe in monotheism is violating the natural law and therefore is subject to compulsion. So, I mean, is it even possible to believe in the natural law in this period while still having what we would now today consider a tolerant viewpoint on religious belief? Well, actually, I think that natural law, if it is intended as Aquinas intended it, is actually conducive to toleration. Because I can, for instance, quote one definition Aquinas gives of natural law. He says, is nothing other than the light of intellect, which has been gifted to us by God. Thanks to this, we know what must be done and what must be avoided this light or this law has been given to all human beings. So really, natural law boils down to the way in which what Aquinas called eternal law is specific to human being. And at the end of the day, is the light of reason to which all human beings, if they use that, they should be able to come to a view an agreed view about what should be done and what should be avoided. So I think that actually endorsing natural law in this broad sense of recognizing that all human beings have a rational nature and that this rational nature should give us certain ways to behave toward other human beings. For instance, the rule of reciprocity do not do to others what you don't want to be done to you, which is uh, something which uh, can be in a way regarded as part of the natural law, I think uh, is an excellent way to have a universalized view of toleration. It also seems like there's a kind of puzzle to me when I think about intolerance regarding religious belief, namely that it doesn't really seem plausible to say that people's religious beliefs are fully up to them, right? Because people believe whatever they believe based on, let's say, their upbringing, but also the evidence that they've considered and so on. It's not like you can just believe whatever you want, right? Indeed. And so I'm wondering whether in the period we're thinking about, it's so like maybe the 16th and 17th century, did they make a distinction like that? Did they say, well, even if we are in favor of compulsion, let's say, and intolerance, will only compel your outward behavior and not your inner belief. Maybe because we can't even compel your inner belief. So we'll make you go to church, but we won't make you believe in God, for example. Yes, indeed. This is a problem which is very much debated in this period, in the early modern period. And one way to go, which is a way historically attested in main authors like Hobbes, for instance, or Spinoza, one way is to say, well, uh, belief uh, is uh, not uh, subject to the will. Uh, nobody can uh, coerce your inner thoughts. But uh, what can be coerced uh, is uh, your uh, behavior. So as you were saying, well, let's say that there is an official uh, religion uh, of this country. Everybody has to go to church uh, according to this official religion, but anybody, of course, can, in the inner core of their own mind, believe whatever they want. Now, I don't think this is a truly tolerant position, because it could be that an integral part of your religious beliefs is to worship God publicly as part of a community is uh, to go to church, to the synagogue, to the mosque. And if you say to somebody for whom that is an integral part of their religion, well, it doesn't really matter. You can uh, by yourself uh, at home think whatever you want, but you cannot go to the synagogue. You cannot go to the mosque. 
And, uh, you know, I am only coercing your external behavior. Anything else, you can think of whatever you want. I don't think that is really tolerant of their beliefs. And I guess that in a way, it's when people say, we will compel your behavior, but not your inner belief, you kind of get the sense that they wish they could compel your inner belief. And the only reason they're not going to try to compel it is that it's not possible. Indeed, right? indeed. But then on the other hand, maybe just to play devil's advocate here for a second, maybe there is a way in which you can try to compel inner belief, right? Because you might think, well, I can't tell you now to believe in God if you don't just like by an act of will, but I could, for example, require you to do things that would make you more likely to acquire the belief in God, like, for example, go to church, right? And so actually what I make you do with your body or with your behavior may down the road have an impact on your belief, right? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, again, uh, this has been uh, historically attested uh, as a position, uh, and uh, this is something with, uh, which we still uh, see nowadays, unfortunately. And uh, the view is this. Okay, it is true that beliefs, uh, one cannot believe uh, at will. So it's not that uh, just by coercing somebody to believe, uh, say, that God uh, is through you, uh, you can really achieve uh, this belief. But uh, one thing you can do is uh, to coerce people, uh, when, especially when they are young, coerce people uh, to go to Sunday classes. Uh, or as we are seeing nowadays in China, you can get all the Muslims uh, into camps uh, and uh, re-educate them uh, until uh, they, through this uh, re-education, that uh, they come to internalize a certain uh, set of beliefs. And uh, this is a position which uh, has been uh, put into practice uh, in the early modern period, uh, and uh, it has been put into practice also nowadays. So I think it is uh, not uh, sufficient uh, in order to reject uh, coercion in uh, matters of religion uh, to say, well, uh, you cannot coerce people uh, because belief is not subject to the will. Mm -hmm. Because there is a way around that uh, saying, uh, sure, I cannot make people believe uh, things at will, uh, but say if I take away their children when they are young enough uh, and I educate them in a completely different system of beliefs, uh, I may not convert the parents, uh, but uh, the children uh, probably will grow up with this uh, different set of beliefs. I guess that actually leads us to another rationale that was used at the time for in favor of coercion, which is that even if I respect your right to be wrong, I might not want to let you lead other people into false belief, right? So for example, I might say, sure, if you want to deny the Trinity in your heart, go ahead, but don't do it in public, because if you do it in public, then you'll corrupt other people. And so I'm protecting other people from your false beliefs. Yes, that was indeed also something which was uh, done at the time and resulted in uh, prohibiting uh, certain communities uh, to um, teach or to have their own uh, educational institutions, uh, precisely because the idea is uh, these uh, pernicious or false or, or mistaken uh, beliefs uh, should not be spread to other people. Uh, and again, I don't think that that is uh, a, a truly tolerant attitude. Because to be truly tolerant would be to, as you said before, combat that with rational argument or persua persuasion. Yeah, to enter in a dialogue uh, with these uh, different belief systems. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, if you think that uh, you have uh, a better view of certain matters, uh, the way is uh, to discuss it mm -hmm. with other amongst the communities. Yeah, I actually like your point that the belief in the natural law would actually be a support for that procedure, yeah, I right? Think because so. it sort of expresses this optimistic faith that if everyone's just rational, then we'll get there in the end, or at least we won't come up with irresolvable conflicts that can only be sorted out through violence. Indeed. At the very least, you should not sort out conflicts mm -hmm. with violence. I think that when it comes to religious toleration, we do have to accept that at the end of the day, there will be um, communities uh, which will continue to all the different beliefs. But I think a truly tolerant society should be able uh, to have a dialogue amongst this different system of beliefs. Uh, and uh, you can do that uh, only, in my view, if uh, you recognize that we are 
all human beings are with reason and on that basis so we can reason together. That leads me to another question about the political and historical context, because in the early modern period, there emerged this idea that in each geographical location, the people who live there should just follow the religion of the ruler. The ruler's faith sort of determines the faith of the people. And on the one hand, that might sound kind of intolerant because it sounds like everyone in that kingdom is required to follow the faith of the ruler. But on the other hand, at least it sounds like a kind of recognition of the sort of pluralism you were just describing. So would you see the emergence of that kind of compromise more as a source of tolerance or intolerance? Historically, I think that was more uh, an engine of tolerance, actually, because uh, that was the arrangement which uh, emerged uh, in uh, Germany, speaking uh, broadly about the Central Europe, uh, after the Thirty Year War, when uh, after these uh, really terrible uh, fights uh, between uh, different religious confessions, uh, the solution which was hammered out was uh, that uh, each uh, principality or each free sub-political entity inside uh, the Holy Roman Empire will uh, have uh, to follow the religion uh, of the ruler of that uh, principality, say. What happened, uh, in fact, uh, is that, first of all, uh, all uh, three main uh, religious confessions, uh, the Roman Catholic, uh, the Lutheran, and the the Reformed, uh, were uh, protected by the law and were uh, tolerated under the protection of the law under uh, one uh, political entity, which was uh, the Holy Roman Empire. And uh, what happened in practice is that uh, there was a balance between a Roman Catholic uh, Lutheran reformed uh, uh, in the sort of parliament uh, which was loosely ruling uh, the Holy Roman Empire, that is to say the Regensburg Diet. So I think historically that was a way in which uh, different uh, confessions uh, could uh, actually live together in a broader political entity. And it is uh, different uh, from what happened uh, in roughly the same period uh, in absolutistic states uh, like France, in which uh, there was Louis XIV, who was a a Roman Catholic, who imposed Catholicism in an absolutist way to the whole of France. Or for that matter, also in England, in which uh, despite having advocates of toleration like John Locke, that toleration was not extended uh, to Roman Catholics. So the toleration... uh, of which even Locke was talking uh, at the time, uh, was a toleration uh, amongst uh, different shades of Protestants, not really between uh, Protestants and uh, Catholic. I think that historically, in the same period, in the Holy Roman Empire, this sort of uh, balance uh, was uh, achieved through this rule, uh, at least in different parts of the empire, different uh, religions, uh, different uh, religious confessions uh, could be protected by the law and the people could uh, engage in it. As I was saying, uh, what also happened historically is that sometimes the ruler will uh, have a certain religion, uh, say the ruler would be Calvinist, uh, but will not impose uh, that uh, on his uh, subjects who will remain uh, mainly Lutherans. Uh, That is what happened in Brandenburg. uh, And what that historically provoked is a stronger drive toward trying to reconcile different confessions. The same thing happened in Hannover, where for a period the ruler was a Roman Catholic, a convert Roman Catholic, and the population was actually Lutheran. And the ruler recognized that it wouldn't have really been a good idea to impose is a religion uh, on the population. Yeah, I suppose it's also just a bit unrealistic and unfeasible to Indeed. imagine, you know, from one week to the next, everyone in the whole country changes their religious belief because the king went from being reformed to being Lutheran or something. Yeah, it would have been a, a disaster right. uh, and a political disaster. And uh, in fact, in, in these two cases, for instance, it, it wasn't enforced in that way. So just one last topic I wanted to touch on is something you just brought up, which is these figures of the 17th century, like Locke, who are seen as kind of heroes of 
even free speech theory or certainly religious tolerance, because they argue very strongly for that. Leibniz also said that there's a natural right to express one's beliefs. And so I'm wondering how seriously we should take that. I mean, should we really think of them as forerunners of our modern day conception of religious tolerance? Well, I think that thinkers like Locke or Bale had a huge impact in really opening up our modern conception of toleration. So I think that it should absolutely be given to them that what they said in their time was really extremely innovative and opening up a new way to think about the living together of confessions. Having said that, uh, we have also to recognize that uh, there were uh, very significant uh, limits to what uh, they were proposing. Uh, For instance, Locke, as I was mentioning before, although he is uh, routinely seen uh, as an apostle of toleration, he was excluding Roman Catholics uh, from toleration. It's a pretty pretty big exception. A pretty (laughs) big exception because the Roman Catholics uh, were half of Europe. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that was driven by the concrete political situation in which Locke was living, but even so, that was really not a minor exception. Um, That is why I think that uh, a certain historiography needs really to be rewritten, and we should also look at the other nations or other political entities, uh, which at the same time in which Locke was writing, had to find different ways to accommodate in the same political entities the main Christian confessions. Wouldn't Locke, though, say that he had a good reason for being intolerant of Roman Catholics, namely that the Catholics were themselves intolerant? Because that seems, I mean, at first glance, that seems like a pretty reasonable position. So I'm tolerant of people's beliefs as long as they don't themselves exercise coercion or intolerance towards people with different beliefs. Of course, this was one of the arguments which were presented, but the difficulty then is really to decide who is the tolerant and who is the intolerant in that situation. Because, say, if you are the Pope, let's say, and you see that in your political entity, there is uh, somebody who is uh, telling you that uh, you are the Antichrist and uh, is breaking uh, the unity of your uh, political entity, you might well think that uh, breaking the peace uh, is not something uh, which can be tolerated. As regards the Roman Catholics uh, in uh, the England of Locke, it must be said that the idea that they would have been uh, following what the Pope was uh, telling them to do instead of being uh, loyal to the authority in the English state, I don't think that was really substantiated uh, by what uh, most Roman Catholics uh, were doing uh, in England. And in fact, even in Locke time, uh, and even uh, people uh, in uh, Locke circle, uh, were challenging this idea that the Roman Catholics, uh, if uh, they were tolerated, would have done what the Pope was uh, telling them to do only because they were Roman Catholic. I'm sure that the Pope would have wished that Louis XIV uh, would have done what the Pope told him to do because he was a Roman Catholic, that Louis XIV had no intention of doing what the Pope (laughs) was telling him to do, even if he was a officially a Roman Catholic. And we should also remember that uh, historically at the time, the two arch enemies on continental Europe were actually two Roman Catholics, Louis XIV and uh, Leopold I, the the only Roman emperor. They were both uh, Roman Catholics. So it's not that uh, because they were both uh, officially, as it were, subject to the Pope, uh, they would uh, somehow do what the Pope would tell them to do. Well, thank you very much for that wide-ranging philosophical and historical reflection on religious tolerance. 
My right. pleasure. And we'll be looking at a lot of these issues still as we go on into the future. Eventually, we'll get to Locke and Leibniz and some of the other figures from the future that we've just mentioned. But next time, I hope you'll join me as we continue to look at the philosophy of the Reformation period here on the History of Philosophy Without Any Gaps. Mm-hmm.